in a nutshell, the, the biggest stories in financial markets every day. That's how uh, I think Sean came up with, with that tagline. And that just speaks to what we're, what we're after. We're not necessarily chasing every um, you know, stock that's moving around or, or what some pundits said on, on TV, but really just what are the big market movers or, or in some ways, what is a story that's being overlooked, but we think is, is substantial uh, long, generally long term, even though it's a daily newsletter, we're trying to think about things that are going to have bigger effects down the line. So, so I first want to start off with you, Sean. Just I want to talk a little bit about your both your backgrounds. Talk to me about just college, post college experiences, and then your transition to TIP and getting into the financial markets and and writing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, for me, my, my financial markets and investing origin story, I guess, starts probably around like middle school, high school. I used to, I'm kind of embarrassed to say now, I used to be a, a frequent uh, watcher of uh, Jim Cramer's Mad Money. And so that's where, that's where my story begins is just seeing that show on TV weeknights. And I remember in the evenings rushing home to, to watch it. And that was when I first, I think the first stock I traded, I tried to do the IPO of Fitbit. And I just, I had no idea what I was doing. But I love the energy of it. I love the complexity of financial markets. And so I was I was intrigued. And I guess, you know, flash forward a, a few years and uh, I'm at college and I'm officially studying finance. And then all of a sudden the world is is upended by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, I'm sent home and I'm, I've been home for like two weeks now and I'm already, you know, being driven crazy by the boredom. You can't go out and do anything. You can't see any friends. You go from this like environment where you're with your friends 24-7. And all of a sudden now you're just in isolation with your with your parents and your family. And so I was looking for some kind of outlet, I guess. And I remember just being out on a walk and, and literally being in the woods and searching on my phone. You know, I should listen to something productive that's going to make me better. And so I typed investing podcasts into my Spotify search feed and the investors podcast network popped up. And so that was literally how I started. I uh, from that moment started listening to Preston and Sig's We Study Billionaires episodes and I tried to get through as many as I can. I probably went through dozens or hundreds before I ended up going back to school that fall. And uh, yeah, and ever since then, I've been, you know, I was a weekly listener of, of TIP for another you know, two years after that. And I had just started my first job in the real world and was trying my hand at being an adult and going down a very conventional financial track and studying to be, uh, you know, to earn a, a CFA license and uh, to, you know, like I said, try to work very traditional kind of Wall Street jobs. And I saw a job posting to to work at TIP and I, I gave it a shot. I saw a shot over an email. And I, I think, you know, maybe what stood out in my application was that I had highlighted all the books I read. I made a point of listing every book I'd read in the last two or three years. And I think it stood out to Stig who reviewed my application because they'd all been books he recommended on the podcast. Basically, every time him or Preston recommended a book, I went out and bought it and read it. And so that was enough to, to get me my first interview with the company. And actually took me a few rounds of interviews and some convincing, but, you know, eventually Stig gave me a chance and I was brought on to, to bring the newsletter uh, to life, which I know you had an early hand in Patrick and it was, it was fun to kind of jointly launch it together. That's awesome. I want to get into those books here a little later and, and the transition into TIP and your experience at TIP. But Matthew, I wanted to hear too, first about your, your background school and kind of post post-college uh, transition out of, out of college. Sure. Yeah. Sean didn't, didn't know all that about, about the books. Pretty neat. Um, so I grew up in, uh, out right outside of Princeton, New Jersey, went to Syracuse, studied journalism and finance, but was probably skewed 80% journalism and writing kind of just did what I had to do at the business school basically to get by. And then similar story during 2020, like a lot of people, it just became infatuated with markets part of that surely because seemingly everything was was going upward but also because i really just enjoyed learning about companies learning about their stories origin stories founder stories uh and and what makes great investing what makes great companies that drive our economy and you know in some ways drive our world right and, and jobs can be um you know a calling but jobs are jobs are also a livelihood and we spend so much time uh, working and, and trying to earn money so that we can live lives that we want to live. So that that just sort of uh, became really interesting for me. And at the time, I was working at The Athletic as a sports writer, really nothing to do with financial markets. Um, but 
evenings, mornings, you know, during breaks, weekends, I would just be listening to similar to Sean, the investors podcast, other podcasts, watching YouTube videos. CNBC was, was on in the background for better or for, or for worse. And uh, just trying to learn and pick up information, learn some of the lingo tickers and just get acclimated with the whole space. Uh, and then quick, quickly zooming, zooming sort of out financially investing. I did not do much at all, but I will say one of the biggest influences was my mom who uh, started a, a small account for me when I was growing up. It helped fund a very expensive uh, college tuition at a private school uh, in Syracuse, but it also, uh, she bought just a small amount of Apple stock when I was little. Uh, and it's, you know, not a Good gigantic move. amount, but it's, it's turned into, turned into a much bigger amount than, than what she had invested initially. And I, I was just amazed that I didn't do anything. She didn't do anything outside of the, you know, the initial foresight and investment. Uh, and we didn't, you know, we didn't monitor headlines, news, and all the bearish calls the last yep. 15 years on Apple and other mega cap stocks, all the, you know, it rode through the 2008 financial crisis, 2016, a little dip, 2018, the dip at the end of the year, obviously 2020, I think it, uh, you know, it shed huge value. And, and, uh, ever since then it's just continued to, to, to check, you know, drive upward despite, uh, you know, headlines. And again, didn't read any annual reports, didn't, didn't uh, listen to, to Tim Cook on any calls, but just kind of wrote it out. That's awesome. I think that's such a great experience to just have that. First of all, that your mom did that and to just the whole buy and hold and just sit through it, through the ups and downs and not pay attention to too much noise. It can really shake people out, I think. Sean, I wanted to get back to you and the investing books that you read that Stig had recommended. What were some of the ones that you really that made an impact on you? Yeah, I mean, there were so many great ones. One that really stood out, and I don't remember if it was Stig or Preston who recommended it or where the recommendation came from, but one of the, the most impactful that's changed the way I think about the world is uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, Inserto, his series of book Hold by Randomness, uh, Black mm -hmm. Swan and Anti-Fragile. I've actually only read Black Swan and Anti-Fragile, so I can't speak as much on Fold by Randomness, but those books are just so, you know, talk about a contrarian mindset and, and a willingness mm -hmm. to think differently. Uh, that's really the, the vibe I get from this Intelab. And, you know, he's controversial. Some people don't like his work. Some people don't like his, his personality. But, you know, just kind of isolating the work for what it is, it's incredible to, to think about um, the kind of the many different biases and the, the very common ones that people think about are, uh, you know, like overconfidence biases and confirmation biases and those sort of things. But the more subtler biases, of, you know, I think he uses in that book an example of, you know, whenever something goes wrong, for example, we all fixate on the event that happened. And so, for example, when a plane crashes, everybody fixates on the tragedy and, and uh, you know, what could have been avoided. But every time something or a system in place works the way it's supposed to and prevents a plane from crashing or your car from crashing or, or some other tragedy, those events don't get headlines because we just take them for granted. You know, everything worked as it was supposed to do. Uh, and it's not just magic that things work the way they're supposed to do it. You know, systems are designed to be robust. And that, for me, was one of the really interesting takeaways from both Anti-Fragile and Black Swan of thinking about, you know, uh, from the Black Swan aspect of it, you can have these crises that seemingly come out of nowhere that, in hindsight, were predictable, using like COVID, for example. Nobody in January 2020 that I was interacting with was expecting, you know, a global pandemic that was going to derail the global economy for two years. But it came. And now in hindsight, we can say, oh, well, you know, in 2018 or 2019, the World Health Organization warned about the possibility. And you can you can imagine a, a pandemic is not an unpredictable event, uh, but it still took the world by shock. And so for me, the kind of takeaway that I internalized from that and also from his book, Anti-Fragile, is how can you build your portfolio to not just prepare for these kind of catastrophic risks and that you can't necessarily anticipate, but also, you know, one of the concepts that Nassim Taleb talks about in Anti-Fragile is, uh, well, literally anti-fragility. And it's, it's not just robustness. It's not an ability to, um, you know, handle stress. It's actually getting stronger from uh, stressors. And so it's almost like, I think an example he uses in that book is, uh, you know, exercise. Mm -hmm. 
whenever you lift weights, you run, you're putting stress on your body, you're putting a strain on your body, but now your body is getting stronger. And so it's reacting in an anti-fragile way. You're making your body less fragile by, by strengthening it. And so, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on, on option strategies and, and volatility and those sort of things, but it was really compelling to me to not just think more intentionally about the risks that we're taking in the world and um, the systems that are designed to mitigate those risks, but also within our portfolios. You know, for example, how can you make your portfolio anti-fragile? And uh, instead of being short volatility, as more, most portfolios are, maybe you can structure it to be long volatility. And so you can actually, some fracture of your portfolio can have an asymmetric gain when there's a market crash. Those are the kind of things that, that flip my paradigm upside down. You know, you don't learn that in your traditional business school class to think about those kind of catastrophic risks and how you can actually, you know, become anti-fragile to them. But uh, for me, that was a very eye-opening type of, of book to read. And I've, I've continued to enjoy keeping up with his work over the years. Yeah, those are good points. Great, great books. I think Clay just did a, a review of, of one of Nassim's books. Isn't that how he structured his portfolio when he was managing money is like 90% pretty conservative and then the remaining 10% like like you said taking asymmetric bets. Yeah, that but was, if they that, that if the kind of black swan that right, the black swan yeah. hits then it's like you know really juices the returns. Yeah, I think he called it the barbell approach and the idea right. is you have you know maybe 90% of your portfolio and treasury bonds or yep. the S&P 500, you know whatever your preferred strategy is there with the bulk of your portfolio and then 10 percent of it is uh, you know deep out of the money options that give you that asymmetric you know kind of long vol volatility return sequence in those um you know volatility mostly works in one way right you mm -hmm. know you don't have we don't usually have days where the stock market gaps higher by 50 percent, but we do right. have weeks where this the stock market has fallen by 50 percent. And so there is like, you know, volatility technically can go both ways, but realistically, it's you're preparing your portfolio to benefit from from downsides. And so, you know, the typical advice is to have a 60-40 bond portfolio. But uh, if you're sophisticated, sophisticated enough, and I don't necessarily claim to be, I know that there are there's some strategies to do it. And that's one of the things that Nassim Taleb is, is known for. I wanted to get into the, your portfolios here shortly, but Matthew, I, I know that you read really broadly, not just finance books and I like more philosophy, spirituality, all kinds of stuff, which I really appreciate. I'm the same way. What are some of the books that, that have made a big impact recently that you've been reading or it could be, could be investment books or, or really just however you want to take it in terms of books that have made a big impact on you? Yeah. So. It's a great question. Um, uh, always reading a, a variety. Like, so I'll have financial books on the nightstand and then, you know, by the couch, I'll have a, a meditation book and, and on my bookshelf, I'll just pull off a biography or a, or a memoir from an investor or, or a writer or an athlete. So I try to mix it up. Part of that is to keep things fresh, keep topics fresh, different writing styles fresh and just, and getting acclimated with how different people write, tell stories and, and see the world. So I try to not be, you know, read all equities or, or all, you know, Bitcoin books. There are a few, you know, big ones out there now or, or all Zen and mindfulness books. Cause I think you can overdo it on that end as well on the sort of self-help spirituality. end. so uh, just keeping it a balance is, is really key as far as specific names. You know, I think the big ones like psychology of money, same as ever from, from Housel, I, I don't end up returning to those more than a lot of others love joys of compounding uh the snowball warren buffett was was something i haven't read every page it is a big book but mm -hmm. i've revisited that quite often yeah uh quite a few other mindfulness books as well meditation wherever you go there you are is on my nightstand mm -hmm. uh and then a couple others like the almanac of naval and the almanac yeah. of balaji which i know patrick you've uh, discussed and you've had eric jorkinson on the podcast those are terrific books and yeah i think they are a microcosm of what i try to read which is they touch on financial markets but they also touch on health lifestyle technology all of those things and how they're intertwined and and uh you know it makes us whole makes us human you know making sure that we're complete so that's those are the the ones that come to mind recently and then just briefly on the value of reading like it's incredible and tip totally 
encourages this and it's a beautiful thing just the you look at any great investor they are just reading 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 i think it was oak tree not howard marks but someone there who has said i might have been on one of our podcasts that it's basically looks like a library to visitors at their office sometimes yeah, yeah. And i just thought that was a, a perfect visual most of the time it looks like you're not working but really you're just probably doing you know the most productive thing you could be doing as an investor I th I've seen interviews with like Monish Pabrai and Guy Spear and a number of different different investors and it's the same same thing you it's like it's like hanging out in a library and that's like you said they spend most of their time reading which is like such a wonderful life just to be able to read and learn and study and uh, hopefully uh, make money while you're doing it um, I wanted to get a little bit into Sean some of you've covered and studied so much just with the newsletter. I want to talk a little bit deeper about some of your investment heroes, whether it was a podcast you you know that you, you listen to or a book or just some of the investors that you really look up to. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question and there's definitely a lot of ways you could take it. For me, I've always appreciated the simplicity of Joel Greenblatt's message and he wrote the literally the little book that that beats the market and you know, it's a, it's a simple premise. Focus on companies with high earnings yields and high returns in capital, and you're going to do pretty well. And he devised this, you know, quote unquote magic formula for investing. And I remember hearing that and just all my red flags shot up. And I was like, okay, this sounds like a scam. This is too good to be true. Because, you know, usually when you hear things in markets that sound too good to be true, like the magic formula, right? Mm -hmm. You, uh, you right. should definitely be pretty, pretty skeptical. But his data, his, his returns and his strategy has been thoroughly back tested and over multiple decades has, you know, continuously outperformed the market. It's not really because of any magic, obviously, really, the magic is just investing and owning in great companies with, you know, an intermediate to long term perspective and, and holding on to those investments, especially when those stocks are, are beaten down and, uh, you know, really just enduring the, the emotional side of investing and, and, and not necessarily falling into the trap of, uh, buying the sexiest stocks that have gone up the most or have the most innovative new product that also trade at the highest, you know, price to earnings multiples. And so th there's a simple and kind of elegant message to what he does. And I, I really appreciate too the, uh, he set up this forum called the Value Investors Club that uh, I've, I've tried my hand at to uh, submit a, a few um, stock pitches to that, that haven't been selected, but you know, there's a certain very high caliber of investor that that he has into that forum. And, you know, the really interesting thing to me is that, you know, he set this up and it, it's kind of a it's just an opportunity for anybody, anybody where in the world to who's very sophisticated with stock investing and knows what they're doing to um, submit a, a pitch. And then there's you know, I don't know if he, he personally I think he has a team of people that, that review the best stock pitches that are sent in every single month. Uh, and then you basically get added as a member and then you can see all the most recent picks. But it's not something that you can buy into. Uh, you know, there's no price tag on the membership. You have to it's a, it's merit based. You have to earn your way in. So, you know, I don't know how many years I'll have to keep try, trying my hand at trying to, to earn my way in. But it, it's pretty cool that that club that he's put in. And I, I know that just through trying to my hand at trying to be accepted into it, I've, I've garnered a lot of respect for the process. Um, and really his career in general with, with Joel Greenblatt. It's interesting you said that. I interviewed a guy that you probably both are familiar, Value Stock Geek on Twitter, and he he also recommended uh, Joel Greenblatt's book as probably a, a good one for, well, whether beginner, intermediate, or advanced it, it, investors to, to check out. It's, uh, you, like you said, you can't argue with the returns that he's had. I probably the, the challenge for most people is to hold during the downturns that are likely to happen, you know, to, to stay with it and uh, stick with the strategy. I think that's the challenge is making sure you pick a strategy and stick with it. Yeah. Matthew, what about you? I, what, what are some of your investment heroes? You mentioned Buffett, obviously, and Snowball, but any others that, that come to mind? Yeah, well, quickly on that, Patrick, uh, I think just the other day, it was four years to the day since some just massive sell-off right when COVID was beginning and someone threw the chart oh, up yeah. of all the, the sea of red that yeah. day. And I think, you know, big mega cap tech firms were down 10, 12% in a day. And uh, someone posted their prices at that time. And here we are four years later. So 
to, to both of your points, to be able to ride out those downturns is really where people separate themselves. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't feel like it at the time, but that's really where the returns are, are being made in a lot of ways. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, you know, pretty boring as far as the mentors, like definitely Buffett, Munger, uh, Monish, who's a, you know, TIP uh, family household name. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys I, I come back to over and over, the almanac of, of Charlie Munger and, and the snowball, which going back to my mom, I think right around 2009, right after the financial crisis. I think that book came out in 08, I want to say, or 07, correct me if I'm wrong, which is, you know, interesting timing there in itself, probably a coincidence. Mm -hmm. But uh, that book was on my mom's nightstand. And I just remember being a young kid, I probably could not comprehend m most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but just being enamored by that and, and seeing, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder who that who that guy is and just sort of keeping him in the back of my mind. We did have, you know, a small allocation to, to Berkshire Hathaway as well, but oh, wow. uh, yeah, just keep, I, I always stick to the, to the Buffett Munger approach, or at least I, I, I'm saying I am, you know, we'll see the next downturn. Hopefully I do. Um, but uh, just long-term, uh, long only, uh, you know, mostly fundamental analysis and just really looking at what are, what are masterpieces I want to own in the portfolio for hopefully the rest of my life and, and, or pass on to, to, uh, you know, my children or grandchildren over time. So that's how I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I really don't sell or trade at all. Uh, I don't, uh, try to look for, for new tickers every month or every year just to keep busy. Uh, you know, as let the, let the flowers, you know, grow, so to speak, and, and, uh, just let, let the wonders of compounding work their magic. That's really my, my, um, what I've learned the most. And I, I guess last thing is, uh, is on Buffett, I think his, his 20 slot metaphor has really mm -hmm. uh, resonated with me. And just, you know, I'm probably around 20, if not higher than that by now. Um, but it's just a great metaphor for thinking about investment decisions. And if I think, okay, I only get 20 of these in a lifetime, I better make sure that this is something I really want to stick to. And so just entering every, every decision with that framework is, is really powerful. It sounds like your mom has made a big impact with, you know, the, the book on her nightstand and buying Apple early on. I think it's great to have a parental influence. Sean, I'm curious, did you, was your, were your family, did they, were they investors and did you guys talk investments around the dinner table? Did, did you have that kind of influence growing up? No, I, I wouldn't say quite the same way. You, you know, my dad has always been very supportive of my, uh, journey with investing and, and wanting to learn about it. And he certainly did everything he could to, I guess, kind of feed my appetite and, and make sure that, you know, I was was learning and growing productively. And, uh, you know, he did do some things like when I was in high school, he, he gave me some a little bit of my college fund to try my hand at investing with with stocks. For me, I, I do remember, you know, I, I have an uncle who was you know, he was a banker. And I remember that uh, he would sit around and he'd read the Wall Street Journal in the morning and drink his coffee and then he'd watch CNBC. And so I, I remember, you know, almost looking up to, to, to the success he'd had in life and, and wanting to mimic some of the, the uh, his daily habits. And so I thought, you know, let me just start reading about the markets in the mornings and let me watch CNBC and I'll have a successful life as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I certainly had a number of positive influences in my life that allowed me to to have those early touch points with investing in finance and, uh, and approach it honestly and, and, and just being allowed to learn and make mistakes and fail, which is the most important part. I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, don't have those positive role models in a financial capacity to, to look up to sometimes. And so you're not always allowed to fail and all of a sudden investing becomes this overwhelming and, and kind of scary thing that, you know, again, people are afraid to, you're afraid to make mistakes. Like, well, what if I invest in the wrong thing or, you know, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. And then you almost get paralyzed by uh, paralysis by analysis, right? And you get paralyzed and there's an element of inaction that comes into it, or uh, even just a fear of, you know, rebalancing your portfolio and checking back up on it. Cause it's like, oh, well, I put everything together and let me just leave it. I don't want to mess with it anymore. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite chapters, Matthew, you, you mentioned the psychology of money. My favorite chapter, and I've said this before on previous episodes, is the last chapter called Confessions, where he just kind of takes a look under the hood of how he manages his own money. So I kind of wanted to talk a little further about that, Matthew. You, you touched on it to some degree, but I really wanted to talk about like money moves that you specifically have made 
coming out of college, what you're doing now. You, you mentioned the 20 punch ticket kind of theory that I really like a lot, but talk to me more about some money moves that you're making that you think somebody that is just starting out that's listening to this and investing would be smart to consider. Yeah, well, I'm certainly no, no expert and, and always open to, to learning new, new things, but from, from what I've learned, both from mistakes, um, and, uh, some, some successes here and there is, you know, I guess it starts simple with living below your means and, and, and trying to invest the difference as silly as that sounds. It's amazing. You know, my mom's influence was a blessing, but also on the same, on the other end of the token, had I not had that, I don't know where I w- would be investing wise because it's not taught, certainly not taught in public school, uh, mm-hmm. at least where I was and, and really in business school. I don't know if anyone really even threw up like a basic compounding chart of just like the S you know, S and P the last hundred years, like that was not part of the uh, repertoire of the coursework. So, uh, that, that's just to have, you know, to both of your points to have those model, those role models is, is in a, is in a way unfair. Cause you know, it's just kind of luck and, and who you're, who you're surrounded around when you're growing up. But, uh, that, that was, uh, the biggest thing is just surrounding myself around those people. And, and that was her motto as well. It's just, you know, Anytime she got a bonus or a little bit of extra money, it was invested. It was not, it was not, here's a new car. Or let's go to the Bahamas. It was, uh, you know, let's just put a little bit away and let compounding work. It's magic. Um, and that, that's the biggest thing. Like we can get into allocation and everything, but as far as. Yeah. I kind of was curious, do you strictly, are you more of an active investor or do you, do you siphon off funds into index funds? I kind of wanted to talk about passive versus active investing and what you, what you personally do. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. Link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Yeah, so so personally, I have a small allocation to uh, you know S and P 500 and and the Qs basically, uh, but most most of it is like I said, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Amazon are are my biggest players, which, you know, kind of boring, but that's, that's what I've stuck to. Um, and just incredible companies. And, and then I've, I've the last probably three plus years in dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. Uh, part of that is, you know, Preston, Preston to blame, uh, and his insights and just still have a lot to learn on, on Bitcoin, but the technology is fascinating. And, uh, thankfully the dollar cost average approach has, has worked for people the last, you know, call it 10, 15 years. Um, really excited to follow it as well. So Apple used to be a, a sizable part of the, the overall portfolio and, and slowly Bitcoin is, is, is making up a much larger part of that, both by appreciation and then just by adding a little bit, uh, every month. So I think it's somewhere around almost 50% right now, uh, Bitcoin. And, um, I'm pretty, pretty feel pretty strongly about that. It used to not, it used to be under 20%. Um, and, and we'll, we'll see where it goes from here, but I'm just going to keep keep adding no matter if it, you know, rises 30% tomorrow or, or drops 30%. The dollar cost averaging is really a great way to go. And I don't, I think I was listening to a podcast this morning. I don't, there's not too many people that are sitting in a loss on Bitcoin at this point, you know, like it's worked out pretty well. And, uh, the whole Michael Saylor micro strategy, uh, strategy that he's pulled off is, is, um, pretty remarkable to watch and what's, what's been going on. And I know Preston's a big fan of, of what he's been doing in the last, well, last four years or so that he's been in Bitcoin. But, um, Sean, what about you? I want to take, take a look under the hood. How do you, what do you personally recommend and some of the moves that you're doing in your own portfolio? Yeah. Well, you know, just to echo Matthew a little bit too. I mean, it is so easy to get 
lost in like the individual stock picks. And, and for some people, that's where they start with their personal finances. And so I would just say generally, what's going to be most important for most people is make sure you have an emergency savings fund. Are you matching out your 401k up to your employer match? Are you taking advantage of, you know, IRAs, Roth or traditional? Do you have health insurance? Uh, you know, those are the kind of like basic questions. And then, you know, once you set those basic standards and you you know you're, you figure out how to budget you figure out that you're allocating to your retirement and then the question is okay you know what should i with this 20 30 40 percent whatever it is what fraction of my income that i'm going to be investing with what what decisions am i gonna gonna make with it and you know generally this is something i've talked about before but the, you know there's an illusion of passive and active and i guess in the traditional sense i would call myself a blend of, of passive and active but i would also push back on that and say you know there's in a way, there's no such sense. Uh, there's no such thing as passive investing. There's really just, you know, are you aware of the decisions and trade offs you're making, or are you not aware of the decisions and trade offs you're making? Right. For example, you know, people will say passive investing is buying the S and P 500. Well, the S and P 500 is an index that's formulated by S and P Global, right? And so there are active decisions as to what companies get included and cut from that. And then you say, well, I buy, you know, the entire market. And then I would say, okay, well, you know, how is that index? listing every publicly traded stock is that equally weighted is that market cap weighted so for me one of the things has just been over the last couple of years learning about those trade-offs and not just saying i'm going to be a passive investor i'm an active investor and i only pick you know warren buffett style stocks it's just at every step of the road trying to understand the trade-offs that i'm making with my finances and, and why those might be important um, and then you know another point i would want to make too is connecting back to to anti-fragile and something that sm taleb talks about is uh, I, this concept of via negativa. And so, you know, we often, when we think about whether it's with our health, with our relationships, with our money, we th think about, you know, how can we add more? And somehow we're going to add something that's going to help us. And it's going to be some new supplement or some vitamin, or, you know, we're going to add more exercise into our routine, or we're going to add this stock to our portfolio, and it's going to dramatically improve things. And, you know, the principle of via negativa is, you know, first, let's focus on what we should avoid, what should we not do. Um, and so, you know, maybe with health, it's like, okay, well, rather than trying to train to run a marathon, well, let's start with cutting out the junk food or, you know, whatever it is. And like the, the, literally the via negative and just removing the things that are, are weighing on you or killing you or whatever it is. Um, and instantly you, you, you could have order of magnitudes improvement and the structure of your portfolio or your health or, or whatever it is. So, you know, in, in my portfolio for me, my question often is that quote unquote passive tilt where I, I try to own, you know, most of the market generally in, you know, various ETFs. And then I think a lot about what do I want to avoid? And so for me, that's, I don't invest in Chinese stocks. I, you could say that, you know, I'm missing out on the world's second biggest economy that I'm missing out on, you know, perhaps some of the best tech companies in the world. But for me personally, it's not a place that I've thought through a lot of, I, I don't feel comfortable with the ownership rights there. The, uh, you know, the, the governance, the tensions at, of being a U.S. citizen and trying to invest in a place like that. There's just trade offs that I don't want to make with my money there. And I, it's, a, it's a place that I avoid. And so I, I only invest in, for example, emerging markets ETFs that don't include at all or greatly minimize their exposure to, to Chinese and Taiwanese equities. So for me, to some extent, it's a question of that via negativa with my portfolio, where I start with the premise of let's own everything and then let's cut out the things I don't want to own. Um, and of course, there are times where I see opportunities to, to zoom in on specific things and kind of tilt my portfolio weights in favor of things like Bitcoin or, you know, for example, uh, commercial real estate has been beaten down a lot over the last two years. And I wouldn't necessarily say anybody go out and buy commercial real estate ETF or buy V&Q or, you know, whatever it is, just because, again, there's a lot of nuance out of these different strategies. Are we, when we're talking about commercial real estate. Are we talking about warehouses? Or are we talking about office buildings and what are we talking about you know what type of office buildings like grade a or grade c right so there's just there's just a lot of nuance to these to these types of things but again that's an example of where i have a few different uh, etfs with large commercial real estate exposure that i've been looking at and and probably trying to tilt my portfolio towards what's a pretty beaten down section of the market so uh, it goes both ways but like i said i start with this premise of trying to own everything figuring out what i want to cut out and don't want to own um, short-term treasury bonds, uh, don't want to own Chinese stocks and yeah. also figure out where I want to tilt in favor to it. There's a big sell-off in a certain sector of the market. I might load up there. And, and, and that's kind of my general framework that I operate from. 
I like that idea of via negativa and what to avoid. I remember you sharing with me kind of this idea of political risk. You had invested, I think, in like a Russian ETF, like maybe right before the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. Talk about that. No, like, it's, a, it's a lesson I learned the hard way. This is, you know, applying via negativa for my portfolio is unfortunately not something that I was born intrinsically with the inclination to do, right? This is something that yeah. I, I've learned from experience. And so, uh, you know, I think in 2020, 2021, I was looking around at actually what caught my attention specifically was this headline that oil prices had gone below zero and how could they be negative? And right. I didn't think I understood anything about the oil market and futures trading and COVID was a crazy time and we were you know, a few months in a lockdown, whatever it was, but I knew enough about finance and economics that, okay, oil prices are not going to be negative forever. And right. this seems like a pretty good time where you could buy in and they're certainly not going to go more negative over the next six months or a year. Uh, this is a good time to buy in and look for the upside. So that, that initial train of thought, I started looking at um, buying individual oil and gas stocks and ETFs. And then I came across, um, you know, these, these Gazprom and some of these Russian oil and gas companies that were trading at PEs of like five to 10, even back in 2020, 2021. And they would have, you know, massive dividend yields, massive earnings yields, and also all the upside of the potential price appreciation of, you know, whenever we do recover from um, the from this kind of COVID induced recession, and we have more global demand for energy and gas and energy and oil and gas prices surge again, they're going to have that bonus upside. And, you know, there are some other dynamics I was looking at where, where the uh, interest rate differential between uh, between the the rates that would be paid on the Russian ruble versus the interest rates in the U.S. were at zero. There were a lot of attractive elements in theory about why one should invest in Russia, right? I mean, I, I, it, ever, there were so many things that seemed like no-brainers to me. And it, it yeah. sounds, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to say now that I, I made those investments. But in 2020, um, it seemed like there were a lot of upsides in my favor. And obviously, I held yeah. on to those into 2022 where you, when you had the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it essentially became right. illegal to own any stocks and bonds in Russia. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it, I was only 22 or 23 at the time. And so the amount of money that I was investing is ultimately inconsequential. But it was right. still, you know, a fraction of my net worth that essentially just went to zero immediately. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when they're, when you read John Bogle and Vanguard and the, the, e, the kind of passive investing and ETF approach to investing, you know, you, you don't ever expect that you could just truly go to zero. That was not an idea. You're always told, oh, well, the S&P 500 has fallen 80 percent or 50 percent and it's fully bounced back. And the Nasdaq, you know, you always eventually bounce back. In this case, I don't want to say because of a technicality, but because of political risk and geopolitical right. tensions, um, you know, regardless of whether those companies are good to own, and the fact that I owned them in an ETF, right? It wasn't like I picked two or three stocks. I owned like 30 or 50 Russian oil and gas companies in this ETF. And um, unfortunately, yeah, because of that war, it, the geopolitical risk completely outweighed any of the, the, the upsides that I had thought were so attractive. And so I certainly didn't have an, understand, uh, an understanding of the geopolitical risks that I was taking, mm -hmm. um, the nuances to owning international equities, and even the fact that, in theory, sometimes you can be right. Like, mm -hmm. objectively, I was right. R betting on oil and gas at that time was the right thing to do, and Russian oil and gas stocks were the cheapest ones to bet on. Um, yep. But, you know, th there's a clash between the theory and reality. And so having an appreciation for political risk and... Uh, it's it's just something that I've I've come to to think a lot more about over the last couple of years. And so, for example, like I said, when I look at at China, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that I think there will be an equivalent fallout in relations between the U.S. and China. But when you're talking about the chance of your portfolio being zeroed out if you have 30 percent, mm. right? Most emerging market ETFs it's dropped now because Chinese equities are are down a good bit. But um, you know, the, the average emerging market fund, the MSCI index, is like 30 or 40 percent. Chinese plus Taiwanese stocks. And so mm -hmm. if you're putting a substantial chunk of your net worth into that, there's a chance that that could get zeroed out for uh, for similar reasons. And so those are the kind of concerns. And that's where I say this is just something that's it's a too difficult pile, as they say, that I, it's yeah. just not worth the, the downside risk and the, 
of owning and also the stress of trying to constantly monitor and think about how those risks are evolving over time. And I think it's such a good learning lesson to have this experience at a pretty young age in your investing career. I mean, this is a lesson that you'll never forget, right? That you'll carry forward for the rest of your life. So it's pretty invaluable. It's a, it's almost just like a pretty cheap education in a way that 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 you had, even though it hurts at the time to, you know, nobody likes to lose money, but it's really a pretty good, pretty good lesson. Um, yeah. Matthew, I wanted to kind of segue a little bit into your experience at TIP. You were you said you were listening to We Study Billionaires and some of the podcasts, but how did you first find out about the newsletter and and um, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you found out about TIP and the newsletter and the process of applying and then coming on board to TIP and just what the experience uh, has been like for you. Sure. Yeah, it, it's uh don't remember, honestly, the exact specifics of how I came across the, the job posting. I think I had just been a big listener and ended up going to the site. And I want to say I just saw, saw one of the postings and submitted the application. I believe the the sample S, sample writing piece was a was reflections on a Warren Buffett interview on um, one of the podcasts. Might have been a, a Robert Hagstrom interview who wrote the you know he wrote the Warren Buffett way and probably should have mentioned that as an informative book. Love how he talks about. Uh, I think there's a quote in there where Warren says, "Robert, we're just focus investors," and I just that was like just really um, well well articulates so much of, of what Warren's about and that mentality. Uh, so that was the the application and ended up speaking with with uh, you know a former excuse me former podcast host and Robert and then uh, Sean and Stig as part of the interview process um, was challenged during that process I think a couple of times and and um, at, they asked really great questions it was not a, a breeze hiring process by any means fortunately uh, they they brought me on which I'm so grateful for this has been the by far the the most uh, exciting, uh, education-filled, uh, peaceful, happy work environment that I've been a part of. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, it's really been, as Stig says, optimizing for happiness. And you can see that this is not a work-around-the-clock environment. This is a, for the most part, work when you, went, when you want and how you want, and really just putting us in the driver's seat, sort of giving the, you know, the point guard of the team sort of the reins to run the offense the way they want to. So I love that we can just get up every day and look at that blank newsletter, Sean and I, you know, seven, yeah. eight, nine a.m. and and try to make a, you know, work with that blank canvas and just make something that will resonate with people in such a clickbait headline crowded media space overall. And I'm just right. speaking generally as newsletters as part of media. Um and really just trying to to differentiate ourselves, educate readers, inform them. And as, as Sean and Stig have have sort of laid it out in, in some of our emails every day. We're, we're, we're getting feedback from Stig. And I think one of the lines that stood out was, uh, we're taking care of the reader. And I really like that that phrasing and, and just sort of serving the reader and just trying to walk them through a, a scenario and, and, and explain a financial concept beyond just a stock moving up or down or, or an energy market doing X, Y, Z, but really explaining why and, and telling the story behind that. Yeah. Sean, how about you? T talk a little bit more about your experience of coming on. You shared a little bit about uh, early on that you were listening to a lot of podcasts, but I want to talk. You you trained me on the newsletter and I learned a ton from you and kind of onboarded me in many ways. So I want to hear a little bit more about, about your experience coming on into TIP. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think I joined February 2022 or March 2022. And there was this like three or four month gap, right? We didn't start the actually start publishing the newsletter until July, but the, the whole purpose that I was hired for was to write the newsletter. Uh, but because of some, you know, advertising arrangements we had in place, we weren't going to start until July. And so I had almost three or four months of, of kind of empty time to fill. And so I spent a lot of that time just reading and learning and sort of at, at Stig's guidance to some extent. And then also we kind of, thought, you know, hey, we've been looking for a YouTube post, which is actually the job I originally applied for. Uh, and I said, you know, why you have some time to kill? Why don't we send you a camera and start making some videos? And uh, it, it was almost full circle because, like I said, when I originally applied to work at TIP, I had applied to be a YouTube post. And over the course of several rounds of interviews, they decided that 
um, yeah, I'd be a better fit to, to be a newsletter writer. But uh, yeah, so I, I ended up with cameras and I, I, it was quite a process to get everything. You wouldn't believe the amount of work that goes into a YouTube video and also, you know, even just our newsletter each day. Uh, just to get everything looking and sounding right. And so I, I know as a podcast host, Patrick, you can also appreciate that. So I had a several month stint just making uh, basic YouTube videos about finance and, and book reviews before uh, I settled in full time on, on focusing on our, our newsletter, We City Markets. And I know I had the privilege of, of working with you pretty early on, Patrick. And, and one of the kind of lasting messages that one of our colleagues told me of, of how to think about the newsletter is, you know, let's create something that's of the same quality of our flagship podcast, We Study Billionaires, and let's do it in newsletter form. And so I brought that to the newsletter very seriously of, of being a longtime fan of TIP and, and wanting to feel like I could re recreate the same quality and value um, and trust with people that had been built up over our podcast over the years in this new media format. And uh, I, I'd like to think that we've accomplished it or we've, we've put a lot of work into um, just getting better every single day. And I mean, w I know we look back at the early editions of the newsletter and it j on a day by day, a week by week basis and month by month basis, I mean, it has just gotten exponentially better. And, and that's not because we're brilliant yeah. people, that, that's just because we've been so humble of, of every day we say like, hey, what can we do? How can we improve this? Should this be shorter? Should this be longer? Can we do a better job explaining it? You know, would this font look better? Should we bold this? Where should we add in links? And just every day we being, willing to change and being flexible and, and having an open mind for how you can improve things. And so, you know, sometimes I look back at some of the first newsletters I wrote and that also we wrote jointly together and I cringe. And then I also kind of see the beauty of that, that progression that we've, we've made along the way. And, you know, it's certainly busy as, as Matthew said, you, know, you start every day with a, a blank slate, which is just scary to an extent, you know, when you're focused primarily on writing the newsletter, every day is, is a new day. And, it's not really like any other job, you know, I, I've had other jobs and have plenty of friends who work, you know, uh, in insurance and banking and, and regular types of job and your work carries on day to day, right? You might have projects mm -hmm. you do for weeks or months, but you know, at, with a daily newsletter, it's, it's kind of something you craft and curate. It exists for a single day and you spend mm -hmm. all day working on it and then you send it out. And then by the next day, it's already outdated and you're on to the next one, you know, and there's not a, necessarily a continuity of, of newsletters, right? Every day is, is kind of a new day when you're trying to provide current market news to keep people informed about what, what's happening. So even just that process of, of starting anew every single day has been humbling because, you know, sometimes you say, man, I, wa I, I wrote a killer newsletter yesterday. Yeah. And then it's like on to the next. And so yep. it's very humbling, you know, like your, your ego can't, you can't latch on to success too much because um, you're, you're always turning a new page constantly. Yeah. It's like you're creating a baby every day and releasing it out into the world and moving right. on to the next baby. <laughs> right. It, it's like the, um, you know, the, the like sand mandalas. I'm not sure what they're called, but these yeah. intricate artworks that are drawn yeah. in sand. Uh, and then they're just immediate, they're cleared away as soon as they're finished. It's, it's kind of what, not to compare, you know, our newsletter writing to, to the beauty of that type of art, but it is the same idea of you, you put so much effort into something and then you just wipe the slate clean. It's a great analogy. It's it's really true. It's there's so much work that goes into a newsletter. I I don't know that the average person can really, you know, when they see the finished product, appreciate how much work that actually goes into each day producing that much content. And I remember the early days they were the newsletter was way longer and like it was a lot more content to produce. And um, yeah, it's it's interesting to see the evolution. For, for our listeners, though, that aren't, aren't current subscribers, Matthew, can you talk a little bit about like w more in depth about what the newsletter is geared toward, toward what you're trying to accomplish, the mission, that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Well, it's basically, in a nutshell, the, the biggest stories in financial markets every day. That's how uh, I think Sean came up with, with that tagline. And that just speaks to what we're, what we're after. We're not necessarily chasing every um, you know, stock that's moving around or, or what some pundits said on, on TV, but really just what are the big market movers or, or in some ways, what is a story that's being overlooked, but we think is, is substantial, uh, long, generally long-term, even though it's a daily newsletter, we're trying to think about things that are going to have bigger effects down the line. So that's what we're, that's what we're after. We also, uh, obviously keep track of S and P NASDAQ, Bitcoin, oil, gold, all of that's in every newsletter. We usually try to sprinkle in a little fun in the in the intro uh, and some charts as well, which we've really 
doubled down on the last call it what maybe a year sean um of really just adding more visuals so that people who you know realistically are commuting home or in line at the grocery store on their phone reading it they're, they might be skimming or scrolling so we we do want to have speaking to the mission point we do want to have something accessible something where you don't need uh, an mba uh to understand um something that you know in, in all honesty probably a, a college student would would be able to understand virtually every word because we're really spelling it out and credit to sean for um you know financial terminology really just spelling that out for for readers which you don't always get when you're reading the wall street journal or bloomberg which are great you know great platforms but we really try to educate and inform and add add those definitions add those examples add those stories to uh to the headlines so that's that's it in a nutshell we'll have some pop quizzes some polls for fun as well and just to sort of put it put a cherry on top yeah, it's good stuff. I look forward to getting it every day. Sean, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more from you about just how the newsletter, how you think about the evolution of it. Like you, you were there at the very start of it, started it. I mean, you're the founder in many ways. How, how has it changed over, over time? Like how would you say it's kind of progressed and you said it's gotten a, a lot, lot better and it has. Talk to us a little more specifically ab about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it was one of those things where we, we truly started with the newsletter, with an open, open canvas. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was just asked to take, you know, we built up this email list over years of, of uh, doing the podcast, but we weren't necessarily emailing people and, and communicating with, with uh, folks who had, had signed up to, to hear from us. And so, you know, the mission was kind of just, hey, let's build a daily newsletter. And then, Sean, let's figure out, you can figure out what it should look like, how it should read, how it should sound. And so, you know, it, it wasn't this kind of thing where like from day one, I knew I didn't even really know who I was writing for. Right. Like I, I was trying you're trying to figure out who's actually going to read this, who is this going to be valuable for. Um, and that's kind of one starting place. And then from there, you have to figure out, OK, you know, how should this actually look? How should it flow? What should the tone be? Right. Should it be more casual and fun or should it be very serious and professional? So there's a lot of different ways we've gone. And I would say we've pushed in those different directions over time. And. I would probably say at the beginning, I, I, I thought I almost took it more seriously than I needed to. And mm -hmm. over time, I've got serious. What do you say more about that? Serious in what way? The, the tone of the, the writing was yeah, more serious? Just like having fun, you know, making jokes, um, mm -hmm. interesting, to, li linking to interesting things, even in pop culture and stuff, you know. But, but when I first yeah. started, I think I, I thought I needed to have this very strict financial markets focus and just talking about mm -hmm. numbers and treasuries and stocks and exactly what's happening in a, in a very technical level. Um, and over the course of doing it daily for, for nearly two years now, now, this is something Matthew and I have talked about. We just want to have fun with it, right? Like yeah. you just when you're yeah. having you know fun with what you're doing, you, you just life is a lot better. And so mm -hmm. in some ways, the newsletter has, I would say, become more casual. It's become more fun to write and hopefully to read. And, and hopefully just easier to read too. And so, yeah, it, I mean, like I said, it's been a constant, a constant work in progress, but you know, we've ended up in this place where we, where we realize, like, you know, I'm, I used to, when we first started to think about, you know, okay, I'm writing it for this person, you know, John Smith, 40 years old, who lives in Maryland, or, you know, and you'd have some idea of who you're writing for. Uh, and over the course of time, it, and it took me a little bit to, to learn the wisdom of, you know, just put something out that you want to read and that's mm -hmm. interesting to you. And so that's ultimately where we've leaned into is me think, I think really it's gone from me thinking about trying to make something that would make other people happy and to just creating, you know, knowing that I'm an investor and somebody very interested in finance myself and just figuring out, you know, what would I enjoy reading? And uh, yeah, that's where we've ended up. And, you know, along the way, we've, we've learned some small things of just like that I've thought about is, you know, how exclusionary a lot of the language is in, in finance and in business in general. And like, you know, even you open up CNBC, which is considered the most mainstream and accessible, you know, business and, and financial media company. And there's just still so much jargon that's used. And sometimes people don't ask like the, the first questions first and the principles of like, what does it actually mean? You know, what is actually inflation? And uh, what what is an interest rate? And why is it important? And so, you know, we don't always go through at such a basic level in every single newsletter. But, you know, if you're reading every day, I think you'll see that we take a lot of those opportunities to just zoom in in ways that other people don't and, and answer those principled questions of like, sometimes 
you just take for granted that you think you understand something and you have to you have to have somebody else push you and remind you of like to, to question you know something you just assumed that you understood about financial markets and this is why ipos happen the way you do and you just take it for granted that that's the way it is and it's like well hey maybe there's a different way to do an ipo right and so the, just those are a few examples of um how we've tried to as matthew said try to make things as accessible as possible to people and and retaining the sophistication of the concepts while removing the ex the exclusionary jargon that makes people feel like they're not qualified to read business and financial news. Matthew, I wanted to hear a little more about as you're going through the process of writing, what are some of your favorite resources that you're turning towards to to craft the newsletter? Yeah, so uh, certainly mainstream news, like Sean said, we're reading just sort of we, we probably get, I don't know, Sean, Sean might get a bunch as well. I probably get to, at one point 20 newsletters in my inbox yeah. a day. Uh, yeah. And part of that was just sort of seeing what other people are doing. I've since mm -hmm. unsubscribed and tried to yeah. clean out the, the clutter a little bit. Uh, but we're just reading all of those, you know, scanning CNBC. Sometimes I'll scan CNN and CNN Business just to get a pulse. We're not necessarily writing anything based on those articles, but just, just to sort of get a, a feel for what's going on in the day, both financially and, and not. Um, the, I think the main ones Sean and I keep coming back to are Bloomberg, uh, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, occasionally New York Times and Washington Post. Um, those are the, those are the, let's just call it four or five that we, that, uh, that I'm reading every single day um, that, that we have uh, accounts with and, and we're reading, you know, the financial market stories, but some of those Publications also have uh, more business and tech stories as well that we might sprinkle in the newsletter. Occasionally, we'll throw in a sports story, whether it's you know LeBron James's holdings or Michael Jordan being a billionaire. Uh, how does he how does he look about uh, markets and, and you know NBA ownership, for example, or brand deals? So we uh, we try to have fun with it. Certainly, primarily looking to those publications for you know traditional market stories. Uh, but we will we will branch out a little bit and anything just sort of with the ancillary business and financial stories as well for some people. Yeah. Sean, talk to me a little bit about like the vision of where you want the newsletter to go. Currently, you're at, tell me again, what number of subscribers and just kind of your vision for the future for the newsletter. Yeah, well, you know, we're at about 32,500 subscribers and, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to grow it to hundreds of thousands and, and millions. And yeah, I, I was actually looking back at um, a publication we've learned a lot from, and, that, and that's Morning Brew. And I think they're at several million folks who, who read that. And they just celebrated their, their 10 year anniversary. And so, you know, sometimes I, I frustrated, I have my head down and I'm thinking, you know, why are we not getting more people to read this? How can we get it to grow faster and, and, and that stuff? Uh, and then other times I think about, you know, it's just a long journey to really truly. Yeah. I think of it as we're building a business with the newsletter. Um, and it's a long journey to, to build trust with people and, and add enough value to them that they'll recommend reading it to others. And, and you just build that that a sort of following organically. So it's a work in progress. We're almost two years in and I, I'm proud of a lot of what we've accomplished. And um, I think there's plenty of room to, you know, as we've been talking about, I, I think that our message resonates with a lot of people who want to keep in, on top of the biggest stories in financial markets. And they don't want the jargon and they want easy to read charts, that, uh, you know, a, to be cliche, right? A, a picture is worth a thousand words. And sometimes you can convey so much more in a simple chart than you can in a thousand word write up. And so we, we just try to blend as many of those elements as possible of coming up with jargon while also, you know, touching on the nuance of financial stories. Because what kills me sometimes too is that when there are plenty of, of, of folks who do try to very like dumb down what's happening in the economy or in the stock market. And some of that stuff is just is just hard to read because there's no appreciation for the nuance and, and coloring between the lines of, of how complicated some of these stories can be. And unfortunately, you know, the gap that we're trying to fill is that for more of that nuance, oftentimes you have to go to these legacy financial publications that are very technical and very filled with jargon. And so kind of the opportunity we see with folks is to you know, go deeper than you know most mainstream media goes on on financial mm -hmm. and investing topics, while also not having the same jargon that you would get if you picked up a Wall Street Journal or a Bloomberg. So that that's I th the message that I hope resonates with a lot of people. And, and I, so far, it seems like we had a chance to meet up with some readers when we were in Omaha last year for um, the Warren Buffett 
uh, or to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting. Um, and so, you know, it, from what I can tell people, it resonates with them. And also for me, it's just a message that is compelling because sometimes I read things and, and there's so much jargon in it. And I'm like, God, I know a lot about finance, but I, I feel dumb reading this. I have no idea what they're talking about. And then you look up, you know, the terms and the language that's being used and you realize, oh, this is actually very basic concepts mm -hmm. that are just being packaged in this way yeah. that, you know, coming back to that word exclusionary, I, I think honestly, you know, for a long time, Wall Street money managers have built up a reputation of they want everything they do, be, do to be as esoteric as possible. They don't want the average person to understand what they're doing, because if people understood the actual money moves that your average mutual fund or hedge fund manager are doing, you wouldn't pay them the type of fees that you're paying them. Right. I mean, your average money man manager is not doing anything extravagant and they're not some, you know, brilliant, um, you know, Wolf of Wall Street type of person. They're just making very basic moves for the most part. Yep. And they try to use, uh, I think there's a culture of, of language that's been perpetuated over several decades of, of you know, making it yourself sound more important and kind of self-flattering language of, uh, of just making things very technical when they, when they don't need to be. So, you know, that, that, that's kind of my rant about it. But, you know, as I, the more I've peeled back the onions of the financial world, and each layer I go through, I, I realize just like there's a lot there's a lot of that element of people wanting to sound like they're more sophisticated than they are so they can justify charging higher fees. And that's sort of the the unspoken truth. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that we're going to peel back every layer of the onion for everybody who reads We Study Markets, but we really make a deliberate effort of, to just shine a light on, you know, dynamics like that and also just to to cut through the BS and cut through the jargon and, and just put things out there plainly. And also just a respect for people and that, you know, we don't need to tell them what to think, right? We, we think of it as truly like we're presenting information for people to um, decide on their own what they think about, mm -hmm. about different matters in the financial markets. You guys are doing a great job at it. I know one of the key metrics is open rate. And the last time I checked, it was over 50% open rate, which is just testament to the high quality nature of the, the newsletter that and, you know, and the quality content that you guys are putting out every day, I think it's rare to get that kind of number of, of over 50% is fairly rare in, in the newsletter world. Um, Matthew, I've been reading lately about We Study Markets Pro. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? I'm curious about what the new developments are with the newsletter and We Study Markets Pro. Yeah, well, thank you for the, the kind words, Patrick. We certainly, um, you know, we're not about clicks, we're, we're about uh, information. And of course, we Want people to to read our our work, uh, no doubt, but we're not going for um, you know high high uh, you know traffic just for the sake of traffic. We're really right. going for that educational component. As Sean said to me the other day, we want to we'd rather have fewer subscribers who are really engaged and educated and learning than you know a list way bigger. But you know people aren't really opening it, or they're just skimming it, or or uh, we're not interacting with them in a meaningful way. So mm -hmm. just to close that loop there. Yeah, as far as the we study markets pro we're, we're excited to roll that out it's 67 dollars a month and you get one weekly strategy report featuring market charts uh, and historical data to inform and educate investors uh, on their decisions that's weekly we have an occasional signal report as well based off of uh, economic release like, a, like an inflation print for example we'll have something right shortly after uh, those releases we'll have a quarterly webinars and then we're, we might roll out some other uh, features as well. But everybody gets a free trial to start. Cancel any time if you don't like it. And we'd, we'd love to, to have you on board. We welcome you to a one-on-one -on -one intro call. We can hear about what you're looking for, how you think about markets, how you like to invest, what you like to read. Uh, and that can help shape our, our product as well. So we're very much listening and interested in, in feedback. Yeah, yeah and, and just to add to that too, right? You know, the daily newsletter that we, we normally put out, just we study markets, it is free for everybody to, to read and access. And the aim of that, as we talked about for the last few minutes, is to educate and inform people. And, and that certainly doesn't change at all. Uh, but the, the idea with We City Markets Pro is to go uh, and take the kind of information that's being provided, you know, generally uh, keeping people up to date on markets and We Study Markets. Uh, and in We City Markets Pro, provide actionable insights and actionable, you know, institutional level, hedge fund level. Um, data that the professionals are honestly paying big money for to access. And we're, we're taking some of that data and the hope is to, to, to distill it 
and deliver it into you know weekly actionable reports for folks that they can actually um, make decisions off of. It sounds like good stuff. I mean, one of the great things about TIP is it is super entrepreneurial. I mean, Sean, you've you've started a newsletter and you guys have run with it, and this is like a new development that uh, will be exciting to see how it unfolds. And uh, I just want to thank you guys. This has been a lot of fun for me. Um, fun to learn more about you and just uh, your insights on things are, are really helpful. And Sean, for people that want to get in touch with you, talk about how they can do that and uh, a little bit more about how to subscribe to to We Study Markets too, if you could touch on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can just go to theinvestorspodcast.com. Um, it's, uh, it's our home-based website for all of our podcasts and our newsletter. There should be a few pop-ups that you'll see in, in different places for you to input your, your email. Um, you can also go into under the Academy tab. There's a, a drop down and you can click on newsletters. You can see our whole archive of, of recent newsletters. You can subscribe and you can also uh, check out We City Markets Pro from there as well. So, um, yeah, really appreciate you, you having us on, Patrick. And, uh, you know, if you do have questions about the uh, about We City Markets or We City Markets Pro, you can just email us at newsletter at theinvestorspodcast.com. Uh, and we open every email that comes in there and we, we make an effort to respond to everybody who writes in. Awesome. Matthew, how can people get in touch with you? And if they want to reach out and have questions about, you know, anything, whether it's market related or we study markets pro or just uh, rap about some of the books you mentioned, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah. Best way is, is email. Like Sean said, we read every email. We love hearing from, from our readers. So I'm Matthew at the investors com, And you can also check us out on, on Twitter slash X. Uh, we're at, we study markets there and, and now uh, we, we're posting a lot more regularly of late. So uh, check us out there. And we, we do have some presence, like like Sean said, uh, of course, TIP on YouTube generally and uh, and uh, Facebook as well. Awesome. Gents, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Some of the things I really liked about his book, same as ever, is like he talks about how the biggest risk is what nobody sees coming or risk is what you don't see. So you know, it's an important reminder, I think, to account for things in life where things are going to happen that you just can't even imagine. Like, 